Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown. I, I don't know why I keep on saying my name twice in the first like 10 seconds, but as my marketing director or marketing teacher always told me, keep saying things enough, people will believe it and just keep tuning in for that. Um, I am, we are back. Uh, we were not supposed to do this until the end of the month, but we are returning to the legislature here on the 22nd of February. And we are bringing back our Road to 2023 segment where we're going to be talking about the Road to 2023, which is the next provincial election here in the province of Alberta. Now, this is the last full sitting of the spring session of the legislature before the election in 2023. And I wanted to bring on a guest who I have listened to her show and uh, I'm not, I, should, can I call it your show or do I say your co-host show? I, I just don't know. And that is Deirdre Mitchell McLean. Deirdre, uh, Deirdre, sorry, I apologize. Deirdre, thank you so much for doing this. Before I get into this really long convoluted introduction, thanks for doing this. <laughs> nice to be here. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> um, so, before I guess I should have asked this beforehand. It is Dear Dree, right? It is, yes. Dear Dree. Okay, Dear Dree. Um I, I I well let's start with let's start this out of the box. Where did your love for politics come from? Because I thought I had an impressive uh background of political <laughs> buttons, but I'm looking at yours and going, okay, I, I'm put to shame right now. <laughs> so where did your well, love for politics come from? <laughs> so it's funny because I grew up hating politics <laughs> which is probably the that's probably the default stance um but i had uh you know i had a, a politically engaged household my parents talked quite a bit about these things and it wasn't until 2015 um, and i i think i've always I, I must have been keeping up along the way, even though I didn't feel like I was, that I really went out of my way to avoid current affairs for a number of years, was actually quite successful. And, um, but somehow I, I kept up, managed to keep up with a lot of this. But in 2015, <clears throat> I was in a contract role with the Alberta government. And every morning they sent us a, uh, an environmental scan. So if the ministry, the minister, or the premier were mentioned in the news, we got a link to all of these articles. And I, at first, I was like, I'm not reading these, I'm just going to get angry <laughs> if I read them. And so I held off for approximately, I'm going to say a month, like actually looking into bell columns and stuff and seeing what was being said about the political aspect of, of the government of Alberta. And then I started reading them. And at this point in 2015, articles were showing tweets, right? And I was like, oh, there is a use for Twitter. I had heard that a political Twitter existed somewhere, uh, but I, I had never been there. And so... Now I had a hashtag, now I had some people to look at. And so I just started paying attention and, and then I, I had to keep up, catch up, right? Because I didn't feel like I had been paying attention for many years. So I thought, I don't actually know what's going on here. So I started doing the background, the research and, and trying to catch myself up. And as it turned out, like I said, I was surprised to see that I did actually know a lot of what had been going on. I don't know how it got through. I really don't. <laughs> so just for clarification on my point, you say 2015. Now anyone who watches politics in Alberta knows that there was an election. Knows what was happening in 2015. <laughs> so was this NDP <laughs> government or last few months of Jim Prentice government? This was January of 2015. So, so this Jim was, Prentice. yes. So this was also right after the Wild Rose debacle um like it was there was some pretty interesting things happening in january that 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 made it i guess a little bit a little bit more fun to be looking at at that time because you were like what is going on with all of these things and and yeah and then it was just it was just catching up on 
on what had been going on, right? Like what happened in 2012? And again, there were little things that stuck out. I knew that the wild rose almost won in 2012. And then, you know, the PCs pulled it out one more time. So it was, it was just catching up on some of those things. And I, 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 I don't know how to explain how when it hit me, it was like, I can't look at anything else, right? I see politics. I see politics everywhere. <laughs> well, it is kind of ingrained in our society. As much as people don't think it is, it is something that affects you on a day-to-day -day, uh, uh, right? uh, life. And <laughs> as much as you say, oh, I'm not interested in politics, everyone's interested in politics at the end of the day. It's just, are, are there are they people like us who literally put signs and buttons on our wall or are they people who <laughs> actually kind of have a normal sense of reality when it comes to politics and vote every four years or hopefully every four years if they do vote. Yeah. Um, we can talk about the past all probably all day long if we had to, but we, I want to talk about the future because we are about to see the return of the uh, led ledge here in a few in a week and a half on February 22nd with a budget. This is the last spring session, as I said in our introduction. As a political observer, as someone who has her own show, uh, co-host with Kathleen Smith, the Women of Poly AB Poly or at Political RND, mm -hmm. which will be in the show notes for anyone who wants to go and listen, highly recommend it. What are you looking for? What are you looking for on the grand scale of things right now? Before we focus on party politics and party uh, status, what are you looking at in the next few months for uh, the, the return of the legislature? So, I mean, the, the actual ledge sitting, um, I mean, we're going to see, I'm sure, uh, more of a push from Kenny to finish up on some of those uh, platform commitments. And, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not sure they were, they've, uh, the UCP has mentioned more than once now that, you know, they've, they've kept up with, I think it's like 70% of their platform commitments. They've already done all of that. Um, you know, the UCP was elected to bring back Alberta's economy. Now, whether or not Albertans feel that that has actually happened, that's that's going to be decided at the ballot box. So what like what actually happens in the legislature over the next session and then the fall session? I'm not sure that that's really going to make too much of a difference. It's going to come down to, uh, you know, Jason Kenney's leadership review. That is something that's going to. That could change the playing field depending on what happens with that. There's a lot of things going on in the UCP and we'll start with them first because they have a by-election that they have to call, which <laughs> by the time that this airs, it might be might have been called, <laughs> might not have. They have until the 15th of February. So literally a few days after this airs, if they haven't. Okay. Brian Jean potentially <laughs> enters the ledge, which would be an interesting experience. Mm -hmm. The UCP have a leadership review and the the rise of the wild rose independence party has to be concerning to the ucp because let's be honest the the more parties on the right means the less vote for the right the ucp yeah how does jason kenny navigate the next few months because anyone else this would be a daunting task leadership review brian jean just brian jean in itself should be just a whole like hour-long conversation but Brian Jean entering if he wins the uh, by-election up in Fort McMurray, but let's be honest, he is probably a, the likely candidate that is going to win that. What does Jason Kennedy need to do to sort of reset his government? Because he is something in the polls, he is not doing well, and the party is kind of in a weird state of unknown until this leadership review. It's That's such an interesting question because it because it suggests that this matters to Jason Kenny. You don't think it does? <laughs> I would I would I would love to say <laughs> I would love to say of course this matters. Of course having less than 30% support is a problem for a leader, is a problem for a political party. But this is Alberta. <laughs> this is Alberta where I mean I I was, I've, I've 
traveled the the province of Alberta, I have sat in conservative circles, and I'm talking conservative circles, uh, PC events, uh, Wild Rose events, cons uh, UCP events. I have sat in the lion's den, so to speak, and listened to people who support these parties. Um, in the lead up to the UCP merger, right, the, the PC Wildrose merger, in the lead up to that, there were a lot of people who did not want to see that happen, but it happened anyway. And by a lot of people, I mean people like just, just people who attend the conferences. Right. I, I people who attended Jason Kenney's Unite the Right, uh, you know, tour drops, there were people that just really didn't like the idea, yet it did happen, yet they did see a million votes um, like these are these are things that happened despite the fact that a lot of people didn't want it to and coming up to the election, you know, Rachel Notley the NDP were looking at the UCP saying bad things are going to happen if this government is elected. Well, bad things did happen. Now, I think that, you know, Kenny's numbers are because of the fact that people had to pay attention between elections this time, more than at any other time in our lives, in generations, we were stuck at home waiting for a, a COVID update. And normal people i'm saying normal people who do not spend their time looking Doing at this. what we're looking at every yeah. day <laughs> those people suddenly were paying very close attention and jason kenny's messaging was not meant for regular voters jason kenny's messaging is meant for the people that really support jason kenny which seems to be you know between 20 percent and or 16 to 25% of the population actually is behind Jason Kenney. But then you have to broaden that out to the fact that it is a conservative government and people seem to have really short memories when it comes to a conservative government and really long memories when it comes to everybody else. So you've opened up Pandora's box, so I'm going to jump in with you here because I, I want to know from you, from someone who has watched politics, because I, I, I re, I'm a new arrival to this co province compared to most people. I arrived here in 2013 covering politics in Lloydminster. So I got okay. the border city. So I got <laughs> Lloydminster, uh, Alberta and Saskatch Saskatchewan. So I didn't know the background because I did not sit through the 2012 general election. Mm -hmm. But in that election, the PCs were not supposed to win. And if you were looking at the polls right now compared to 2012, the UCP are in the same position that Alison Redford had the progressive conservatives. Not like the exact same, but close to it. Yeah. But as anyone who follows history or follows politics, and you know that that 2012 election, Alison Redford won handedly over the Wild Rose. Now, I never discount Jason Kenney. Jason Kenney is a political master at politics and elections. He can, I don't know how he does it, but he seems to be able to galvanize people and bring them to his fold. Is Jason Kenney the next Alison Redford? Is he going to be able to bring the, that fraction of the people who have gone to the Wild Rose, who have gone to the, uh, the X, Y, and Z of the right-wing politics, because there's about 9,000 independent parties right now out there. And I just, <laughs> I can't, I cannot tell you which one's which. Um, or is Jason Kenney going to be able to bring them back and say, like you said, at least we're not the NDP. We're not the um, NDP. And remember what when they were in power and what happened then? We're just trying to clean up their mess. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what he's going to do. Okay. That's, and that's already started. <laughs> yeah. That's already started. If you look at the, uh, um, there was, a, there was a, a, a UCP poll that went out um, you know what's what's on what do you feel is the is the biggest issue facing Albertans in the coming year? You could only choose one, um, and then the next uh, the next page was if the vote were held if a vote were held today would you vote UCP NDP or are you not sure? They're already positioning themselves as it's it's us or the NDP. Any vote 
you know, a vote for another party is a vote for the NDP. I mean, of course, they're going to do that. So and, and that and I mean, also logistically, that makes sense because the NDP was the next like they they are the ones that came in second if the UCP won. So, I mean, it's not it's not like it's an outrageous uh, position, but. But all, Still, party, all parties do that, right? That's because right. the NDP would probably be doing the exact same thing. Who would you vote for? The UCP oh, yeah. or us or <laughs> none of the above? So it's not like- Which is basically, yeah. Yeah. So it's um, like, it's, it's like I said, it's a, it's, it's not an outrageous position to have, but they are started, they are beginning that and, and it will be, that will be the, uh, the taglines. If the leadership review was held today, and this is just you and me talking. This is like two people who watch politics and follow politics and have no, I'm assuming have no vote in the actual uh, leadership. Well, I could have. Yes, I could we, have. We technically could. <laughs> they could buy us memberships if they wanted to, and then we could vote for them because they have the ability to buy us memberships if they want. <laughs> um, if the leadership review was held today, would he survive, do you think? Yes. Really? Yes. Oh. Okay. So I did do, I did do, uh, I did write, I think it's my pinned tweet right now, actually. Um, when I was looking at the leadership reviews being held in Red Deer, okay, that is a strategic placement. And if you look at, like, you look at the surrounding, like, who's, who is surrounding Red Deer? So you have the education minister, right, who's in Red Deer. You have Jason Steffen, who's also in Red Deer. You are surrounded by Jason Nixon, um, Dries, Devin Dreeshen, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know uh, Jackie Lovely to the north. You are sur- this is UCP country in the Red Deer area, and uh, Devin Dreeshen, I think he, I think his his event, um, I don't know a, a, a derby, I believe, raised one hundred and eighty three thousand dollars over the summer. Yes, one event, 183 grand. These, like, there is a reason that this leadership review is being held around an area where Jason Nixon in 2019 took the, took the regular election with like 78% of the vote in his riding. These are people who have very, very, very strong support. And if they are Jason Kenney supporters, I'm not saying they can rally everybody, but they can definitely rally enough people to pony up a hundred bucks and show up to Red Deer to put a ballot in a box. So now I, I, I now completely understand why Brian Jean is asking it to be digital because, well, or in person. No, they, need it, other, they need other voters to show up. Yeah, exactly. And <clears throat> does, does Brian, if, does it, so are you saying that Brian Jean plays no factor into this leadership review? Because he's the one who's kind of been really pushing it and, I would assume that he has support across this province, but you don't think it's enough that Jason Kenney ha- is in danger of potentially losing that leadership? Uh, or is Brian what? Jean just in Brian Jean's sort of own Yeah, zone? yeah. Brian Jean is just in, <laughs> in Brian Jean's own space. And and the because the problem is you may have support, right? Let's look at let's look at the PC party back in in. 2015. They had support around the province. They just didn't have enough concentrated support to keep them in. Right. They still, they still had, they still had a really great number of votes. They just, they just got annihilated by both sides of the, of the spectrum there. So, you know, Brian Jean may have support around the province. Um, you know, during the the twenty, I think it was the leadership. His UCP the leadership? leadership. Yeah, um, I attended a few events where where he was, and and you know he he did like people showed up. Um, we had full rooms at the same you know just like just like Kenny did, but you have to be you have to be really motivated now. The thing is that I feel like there are more people who are motivated. Um, Look at the last UCP convention, the one that was held this last December here uh, in Calgary, and their numbers dropped quite a bit from from what they had been. 
And so from since the inaugural AGM, they've had about seven to eight or sorry, about 750, 850 people voting for policy. And at the one in Calgary, they only had about 500. Their, their uh, attendance numbers were down. Like they just saw a drop. Now that and, could be because of COVID. Now I'm not trying to discredit what you're saying. I'm just saying yeah, it could be because could, of COVID. But let's be honest, most of the people who uh, who are in the strong UCP think well, that the COVID restrictions need to be that's tossed right. aside. So yeah, let's they're not really that concerned um, as in, in general. But uh, But there's also like just, again, people on the ground. People were pissed off at Jason Kenney either for too many restrictions or not enough restrictions. And they just didn't go. So as much as we, as much as people who are not UCP supporters or not Jason Kenney supporters feel like this is absolutely worth showing up to the leadership review and getting rid of that guy, it's to everyone else's benefit if they keep Jason Kenney. And so you have conservatives that maybe care a whole bunch they're probably not going to spend the money. They got to pay a hundred bucks to go. They actually have to travel to Red Deer. Um, as, as I've heard many people say, Red Deer is out of the way for everyone, <laughs> right? If you go to Calgary, yes, you are in a city of a million people and it's out of the way for Edmonton, but you know what? You're right there. But Red Deer is out of the way for everyone. <laughs> So, right, it's people who can make the day trip. And again, now you're looking at Innisfail, Sylvan Lake, you're looking at Rocky Mountain House, Sundry, uh, Olds Three, Three Hills. You're looking at strong UCP support being able to show up. Uh, I'm assuming the option of Edmonton was never on the table for them. Probably not. <laughs> Yeah, that's not where you that's not where you hold your leadership review, especially now that third parties can purchase tickets. Right? You don't want to be in a stronghold where the opposition can really rally people for their cause. And again, that's another reason why I think it was chosen to be in Red Deer. Yeah. So uh, it's it's unfortunate. I know I know a lot of people will not be happy to hear that. <laughs> but this is how it works. <laughs> I feel the tweets coming in already. Why would you say that it's that way? It's not that way. It's Red Deer because it's convenient for everyone. It's center of the El <laughs> province of Alberta. Right. Sure. Okay. I have a, I have oceanfront property in Drumheller I'd like to sell you as well. Mm -hmm. So let's go for it. Uh, I, I want to stick on the UCP for a little bit longer, then we'll jump to the NDP because I think that's another area that we need to talk about because I've had some strong opinions on that, which has got me into trouble with some people. <laughs> My husband! <laughs> <laughs> the, the UCP are going to potentially lose Edmonton again in the next election, unless something drastic happens, and it could. We always have those election surprises that you never know. 2015, it was hard, math is hard. 2019, it was just everyone like Jason Kenney, it seemed like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the UCP will have to focus on two areas, rural Alberta and Calgary. Now, if I'm not mistaken, you are relatively close to Calgary. You're in the riding of Chestermere Strathcona. Strathmore. Strathmore. I knew that. <laughs> totally. Totally. I knew that as I see Leela hears and Derek Fildebrandt sign behind you. And I could have read it and I don't have my glasses on, so I didn't hear it, read it properly. Um, <laughs> is Calgary the official battleground of the 2023 election? Um, that is definitely. Because if you look at the popular cabinet, opinion, if you look at the cabinet, the cabinet is like. I don't know. I know Edmonton, they have one seat and well, he's no longer in the cabinet or by the time this is recording, he might he's be just on a cabinet. break. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. he's just on a break. It's not <laughs> us, it's him. It's okay. Um, is this budget that they're about to probably announce going to be so heavily Calgary that it's going to be piss, pissing off everyone else because Jason Kenney needs to shore up support and Calgary is the only spot that he can potentially shore up that support, in my opinion, because I don't see the rural areas running to the NDP right now. Yeah, so that's the layers. Um, so like an onion. It is. It is. And and remember that uh, 
the Edmonton and Calgary mayoral races both went to people who are not necessarily UCP supporters, right? So, so there's this other, this other thing that that the province, or sorry, that, that Jason Kenney needs to weigh from a provincial perspective. And that is we can't give Calgary too much because they elected this mayor we don't like. They elected a mayor whose ideological uh, vision does not match with theirs. So if they put too much into Calgary, it could make her look good. So so this is this is something that they do have to way a little bit. Um, I have seen, uh, you know, in, in rural, in rural, they're fighting something else. So in Calgary, they're fighting the NDP. In rural, they will potentially be fighting uh, Wild Rose Independence. And this, like that, that is a difficult space to be in, because they are fighting a two front war. And their messaging their messaging has to be tailored to each set, right? And and hopefully each set doesn't under doesn't read the news <laughs> and understand that we're messaging one thing here and one thing here. Yeah, because, because it'll <laughs> chafe the other side <laughs> really badly. <laughs> and at the whole time we'll just forget Edmonton because well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're costly. we're we all come here once you know <laughs> we're all going to be in Edmonton once in a while and and that's enough for them. <laughs> We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. Um. So let's let's turn to the other side of the aisle here, and that is the uh, NDP. Uh, Rachel Notley is leading in the polls. Uh, well, yeah. I think you and I will agree that polls mean jack squat until election day because we'd have a liberal majority government <laughs> in Ottawa, and Aaron O'Toole would be the most well liked conservative leader in all of time if we yes. leave polls. <laughs> leave polls. <laughs> if maybe polling his own family. Mm. NDP have a very hard rope, uh, tight rope they have to cross here because they have to continue the growth that they are seeing under Rachel Notley with everyone hating Jason Kenney. But they also have to keep their base. And the more they move to the center, they might lose that progressive wing. Because I talked to a few progressives in the last, uh, in December and November, and they were pissed off at the party because they're not progressive enough and they're going to the center. <laughs> and you're like, okay, I guess I get that. How does, as much as Jason Kenney has to walk the tight tightrope of the leadership review, Rachel Notley has to walk the tightrope of keeping her party unified against Jason Kenney. Like if you need a united new democratic party, like she would have to be the leader of it. So how does she do that? How does she do that in the next year? Well, here's something that um, progressives would be, ex well, so they're going to be pissed that I say this, but. Um, <laughs> they already hate me, so don't worry. Right? So Rachel Notley and the NDP have the ability to branch out into the center, and that is a benefit to them. Jason Kenney is trying desperately to hang on to the right wing, which is making it impossible for him to branch out into the center, right? So leave, leave, leave him alone. But the thing is that where, where Kenny risks losing that base, um, you know, Rachel Notley risks losing her more fringe base. And what has happened with the NDP since Rachel Notley, since 2015, is that they have seen, uh, number one, staying power. Right, their votes, their votes did increase um, in 2019. What was it by? I think it was by 30, 40,000 votes. Obviously, you know they lost some seats, but still, there it held. That was impressive. And even if people were like, "Nope, I voted NDP last time, but not this time," they still gained. They gained, no matter which way you look at it. So, 
um, so Rachel Notley and the NDP have the ability to move into the center to take that over. What do, what do they have to do? If they're going to, they're obviously going to govern as a centrist party. I know that pissed a lot of progressives off too, but the thing is they did become the PC 2.0. They, they didn't make a whole lot of changes. They actually, uh, they governed, I would almost call it um, timidly. I think they tried or, or tentatively, they tried, I think, to reassure Albertans that they weren't a socialist scourge, that, that they were not something to be feared, that they were going to help Alberta, they were going to govern well. However, in doing so, in, in trying to baby step Alberta through an NDP government, <laughs> which was a shock. I mean, I had friends calling me from across the country going, is this actually happening? On election night, they're like, it's, are the PCs actually going down? Um, but anyway, so like, I think they, they tried so hard to not scare people about this whole NDP thing that they actually ended up not doing much. And that pissed people off. I mean, it, it almost didn't matter if you were an NDP supporter before. I had never been an NDP supporter, yet I expected change when the NDP became government. Yeah. <laughs> and... I, I think a lot of people did because I, I, I lived through the Bob Ray years of Ontario politics, right? I remember people waking up that morning in 1990 going, <laughs> what the hell did we just do? And then Bob Ray going, okay, we're going to govern. We don't know how to govern, but we're going to do it. And he made massive changes. So maybe it's a little bit of history of her looking at the Bob Ray government of the NDP, Ontario NDP and saying, we don't want to be them. We want to be sort of centrist. And let's well, be and honest. Also, every, everyone in Alberta is more conservative. Our NDP is more conservative. Our Liberal Party is more conservative. We are actually all more conservative, even though there's a lot of people who 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 really hate to hear that. But this is this is this is a a, a byproduct of being educated in Alberta, growing up in Alberta. This is a conservative province. Even if you are an NDP MLA or an NDP supporter, chances are you're a lot more conservative than. The Ontario NDP. Why? Because this is Alberta. Do you think the federal party is going to play a uh, major role in this next election? The federal Again? NDP? Again? <laughs> yeah. And, and I not, I'm not trying to be rude against that. It's just... It's so let, easy. <laughs> Jason Kenney just says Rachel Notley. Well, Jason Kenney and likes to use Justin Trudeau's name more than his own name for some strange reason. But he's, he seems to try to paint... Rachel Notley as the NDP version of Jason, uh, Justin Trudeau and Jugmeet yeah, Singh okay. is is kind of not the uh, entity, but you, you think of NDP, you think anti-oil, you think anti-pipeline, even though you look at Rachel Notley's record, it is pipeline. She <laughs> literally freaking bought a pipeline. How do, she, how do they shed that? Because that's my biggest concern is as much as Rachel Notley is a great person, she officiated my wedding. I, I love her to death. How do you how do you shed a party that is literally a new Democratic Party when you have a federal party? Uh, like, you know what? <laughs> We've had this conversation so many times too. Because do you remember uh, in 2015? So Rachel Notley was elected uh, May the fifth. And in, I think, September, the federal NDP had their convention in Edmonton and introduced the Leap Manifesto and just started a firestorm. <laughs> right. In Edmonton. In same Edmonton. Con same convention that they <laughs> turf Thomas Mulcair, but yes. Yeah. So, I mean, is it, like, it's, it's, it makes it easy for Jason Kenney to say, you know, Jagmeet Singh has just said he wants the oil sands, you know, completely shut down. Does that reflect poorly on Rachel Notley? 
unfortunately it does because it's an easy it's an easy tie if you have a, a federal ndp memberships and you are a member of the alberta ndp and vice versa so i know again we go back to this you are more conservative if you're from alberta and there i mean a lot of the ndp like provincial ndp supporters i know are federal liberal supporters um that's because because the NDP is too far left for them, the federal NDP, right? So, so it's but but at the same time they are the they are tied these parties. Um, you know the the Liberals actually they they made a a public um, oh uh, they severed themselves from the Alberta Liberal Party many many years ago, and well that was probably a benefit. <laughs> <laughs> to the liberal party you know they let's see where really they are now <laughs> too much with it but you know maybe it was probably somewhat beneficial and where where the where the conservative party can say yes look at what our conservative party is federally and and they can stick together on those things but it is it is damaging for the ndp but again it didn't seem to hurt them in 2019 but again, they still lost seats, They right? So, I mean... So why isn't Jason Kenney tied more to the federal conservative party? Because let's be honest, the federal conservative party is going through a shit show, pardon my French, right now with Aaron O'Toole, Pierre Paul Hiver, and X, Y, and Z, whoever is trying to come out of the woodworks there. Why isn't Jason Kenney more tied to that? Because you think, because you list, you talk to conservatives here in Alberta, they don't like the federal conservatives right now because they seem like they're too wishy-washy on vaccine everything mandates. exactly <laughs> so why how is it that one party can be tied to the federal party of their uh name but the conservative party can't even though literally their leader came from the party the federal party like it just seems very mm -hmm. double standard in my opinion <laughs> Well, it is um, co like con like within the constitution of the parties, the UCP and the CPC are not tied, <laughs> right? <laughs> like this is the it it may it may yeah. seem like that's a silly thing and end. And I mean, anyone who does pay attention to politics knows how closely these two right like they absolutely are. It was actually kind of funny when you started to see um, after Andrew Shear got turfed right all of his staffers are coming to alberta because they don't have jobs anymore right? and it's like now they all work for the ucp um so but again this is not something most people know care about um so when jason kenny says that the federal and the provincial ndps are the same party well they kind of are constitutionally they are they are tied together they it it is somewhat damaging, depending on what the leadership of the federal party is doing, but obviously not entirely, right? Um, now, does does it still provide Jason Kenney or any, you know, conservative party in Alberta with some ammo against the NDP? Absolutely, it will always be there. It's it's low hanging fruit, um, and and there are some people, you know, we've. Uh, we've tried to figure this part out too. There's a, there is a psychological block for a lot of people when it comes to voting for the orange sign. Or, I mean, that's not the way it's supposed to be, but we elect blue signs. So this is, <laughs> we don't and care who's behind the sign. <laughs> don't even talk about the red signs because, whoa, the commies are coming. <laughs> and it's, yeah, so there's a, there's a thing, there's a thing, um, you know, it's, it is, uh, I, I don't know that, that it's something that too many people are concerned about. Um, so are, yeah. we a, are we a two-party province now? Barry Morishito and the Alberta Party. So. I'm literally looking at all your signs. I'm like, okay, which party have I forgot to talk about? Alberta Party, Liberal Party, Freedom Conservative Party, which no longer exists, but mm. the Green Party as well. Are we a two party yeah. system and the other parties are kind of taking up space because I, I'm all for democracy and I believe you should vote for whoever you want to vote for, even if you even if I disagree with that vote, you should have the option to vote for anyone you want to. Mm -hmm. But 
are we going the way of Saskatchewan where we are seeing a two-party system and it is going to be that way for a long time? And I'm sorry to Barry Morishita because he's a nice guy. I, I've had him on the show. I, I like his politics. I like him as a person. Is he going to be kind of kept out of the discussion because the Rachel Notley's and the Jason Kenney's are going to take up a lot of the oxygen in the room? Oh, like, yes, 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 maybe. <laughs> Let's go that way. Um, so it, I mean, absolutely depends <clears throat> on what happens with, um, with this next election. Because Rachel Notley and the, and the NDP have the ability to move into the center in a way that the UCP does not. Um, I mean, even, even just the, the setup, if nothing changes from, from today, the setup going into the uh, the 2023 election, there is a united left in Alberta, and there is not a united right. Okay, so this has flipped as much as as much as anybody wants to say, well, Jason Kenney united the right. Well, he may have, and then it's splintered. Yeah. Um, you Even know, the, worse than before. Right. The Alberta Party was never part of that. The Alberta Party was hoping for that middle ground, but they could not get the foothold because of the in there because of the positioning of the NDP. They were government. They were able to show that they're not a scary socialist, you know, tyrant government, that they were very reasonable. They didn't move too fast. Like I said, even though I think they should have moved faster, I think there's things they could have done that would have maybe put them in a better position for 2019. I think what they did also, uh, as soon as the UCP came in and started just making a mess, right? People are like, yes, the NDP was absolutely better. Yes, you know, this is no longer scary. Um, so the thing is that that Rachel Notley and the NDP, if they are, if they're smart, and I believe that they are, they are going to be careful about how far left they go, right? That's, that's something that they need to be careful about because they have the opportunity to form government in 2023 because of the fact that there is a united left all of a sudden in Alberta, you're not going, you're very unlikely to vote liberal. There, there are diehard Alberta liberals who will vote liberal, but they're a very um, dwindling group. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. Well, so particularly, I'm going to ask this question later on, but if you don't have a full slate of candidates, it's yeah. hard to be recognized as an official alternative mm -hmm. because that I give credit to Stephen Mandel in the last pro, uh, provincial election with his, we're going to run a candidate in each riding and God forbid they did. Some of them were named candidates, but let's be honest, some of the named candidates were just named candidates in the 2015 NDP election as well. And that's why we got a lot of people <laughs> went, well, who are you? Well, he didn't see you at your door. So if the parties want to break out, they need to run a full slate of candidates. And I know that is hard for some candidates because there's not a lot of people who would put their names to the Alberta Liberal brand or even the Green Party brand in Alberta. Yeah. And I'm not saying they're bad people because they are great people and I'm having them on the show. I just, I hope that to be- They can manage it. <laughs> ma manage it and to be taken serious, you need a full slate. You do. Running a half-ass campaign is does not do anything good for your party, but also for your brand. Yeah, and that and that's true. Like that's where, um, in twenty fifteen, the Alberta Party, yes, they got a seat, but they didn't run a full slate of candidates, and 
so they missed out on those votes. The vote share increased, um, you know, quite a bit in 2019. However, they were squished out of the center. Yeah. Right. So I think you had, I think you had a lot more people who were UCP supporters, um, or sorry, who voted for the UCP, who were more of that center, right? Because they were not, they weren't left, but in 2015 and, and NDP uh, door knockers will tell you that on the doors, they were saying, whoever can beat the UCP, I will vote NDP, I will vote Wild Rose. And they were just, <laughs> that's, it, it's, it's a, uh, it's absolutely heartbreaking as a partisan to hear someone tell you that, you know what, your party or this other random party that is completely ide ideologically opposed to everything you stand for, I'll vote for them. <laughs> right? It's, it's these poor, these poor people on the doors were just heartbroken. But I remember after the 2015 election, I was up in Slave Lake, Alberta. So Northern Alberta, for anyone who's listening to this, not in Alberta. Um, I, I remember having staunch conservatives come up to me and say, I voted NDP, don't like them, just didn't want the PCs and I wasn't voting for the Wild Rose. It's like, what? Like, right? <laughs> don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I love when people can like adapt to different parties, but when you have people that you're like, they would never vote NDP or low vote liberal go, yeah, we'd vote for them. Like, huh? You okay. Did? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so there was this, so there is this weird thing, you know, happening in Alberta. And, and I don't know, I don't know if it's, if it's here to stay. I feel like, um, logistically, it very well could be just because of the NDP's ability to take over the center. Now, with that, and, and the fact that, like I said, they're the ones who, who got the votes. And people who are, um, tired of the bullshit, they are not going through party platforms, right? They're like, the NDP is the one to beat out Jason Kenney, yeah. right? That's what they're thinking already. They are not looking through platforms. They are not listening to the COVID updates. They are not tuning into a Jason Kenney Facebook Live ever. Um, they've already what? decided... I'm going to get rid do, of them. Doesn't everyone do that on a Saturday night? Right? Like just, just sit down and be like, <laughs> sip in your hot coffee and just watch a Jason Kenny talk. <laughs> Live tweeting it all the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> these are like, these are things that I think we could become a two party province. Just again, it's, it's positioning. The NDP managed to take over that center position. Jason Kenny did not. And he's still playing to his base that I just, I mean, it, it's, it's not like he can move over to the center and be like, yeah, this is, this is a, a good fit for me. Cause it's not. <laughs> this is who I've been I, all my time. Like, I don't right, know why yeah. you think I'm a right wing person. I'm yeah, totally like, center. The guy doesn't speak center. Okay. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> we, I want to look at uh, kind of heading into 2023 as we have been already, but COVID-19 is still here. Yeah. If this doesn't go away and from, as of recording this, there was a report out of, I think, CBC or CTV that they anticipate restrictions are going to be released or removed by St. Patty's Day of this year in the province of Alberta. We all saw the debacle that was open for summer of 2020. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah if if he screws this up again and if we if alberta can actually get through a, a summer without having to go back into lockdown does that put him on proper footing um, or are people or, or or is the right still so pissed off that we even went into restrictions that they're they're, they're, they're going to look for another party no matter what yeah, so Jason Kenny pissed off everyone. <laughs> right? Like just just period. He pissed off everyone. Um except his MLAs. Right. Oh god. Um so so he is um you know, they people that were really upset about the restrictions, they do have a new 
uh, home. They do have a support group, so to speak, in, in Wild Rose Independence. I guess that would be the only one really provincially that they're going to find that assistance. Um, <clears throat> so they have a space where they can go. Now, are these individuals also going to, you know, back that up with their vote in 2023? Eh. Chances are they're going to be like, well, I don't want the NDP to win. So they're going to vote for the UCP. The Wild Rose, I think it's going to have a difficult time. If they've got some good candidates, they might manage to elect a couple. And that comes out of the UCP's uh, numbers, right? Like there's just no other way around it. There's These no are liberal, not individuals. Alberta liberal going, you know what? I, I really like what the Wild Rose Independence Party is talking about. Let's vote yeah. for them over yeah. the UCP or the Alberta NDP. <laughs> exactly. So it happened. like, yeah, it, um, you know, I, I think, I think it's possible that they could that they could come up a little bit. Um, honestly, I really, really wish that we weren't seeing the type of, um, I don't even wanna call it polarization, the type of um, binary options that we have right now, because I think that the, makeup of the legislature in 2000 and from 2015 to 2019 was wonderful. We had a couple of liberals in there. We had Alberta party. We had the wild rose. We had the PC. We had the NDP. We had this, this lovely makeup of, of representative voices that were so I, I, I loved it. I actually, I, I, this helped me fall in love with all of this political stuff because there were things going on in the legislature, voices being heard in the legislature, people doing great things. And, and it was, it was just so good. And then it became this, this, uh, you know, scratching at each other's, banging each other's like heads together. This is what we have now. This is horrible. I hate this. But are we more divided than we have ever been in your time watching politics and even paying attention to politics? I honestly, I don't even know if that's, I mean, we are, we are divided in so much as, um, but I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's more so or if it was always the case. But I really saw it online with, um, and, I, and I still see it. And I, <laughs> I'm not an ultra conservative individual, despite the Derek Fildebrandt signs. Um, <laughs> they're there because I like politics. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have some rhinoceros parties buttons, so I'm not a rhinoceros fan. I but want one of those. Uh, <laughs> there's a bucket of buttons ready for you. <laughs> Oh, uh, I like I I just I do see a lot of individuals and now social media is not a good reflection of your community or real life. <laughs> Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Breaking news here. Twitter is I not know. real life. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's 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 an unfortunate reality. Um but like there are people who, who I, I get my back up when I see people say, you know, conservatives. And the thing is, I try really hard not to do it because of the fact that I know it's not all conservatives, but the conservative parties as they are sitting today, the conservative leadership, the makeup of the elected members of these loud voices that are like, what is wrong with you? Um, these individuals are this 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 populism is giving conservatism a bad name right i am not well actually okay that's the other thing in grade seven i was going to vote for preston manning i learned I about this button for you yeah i know <laughs> i I learned about the, the federal parties and here's this, I mean, 
this was before they were ever elected. They were a new party, but I was, you know, I was in a school in rural Alberta and I'm pretty sure that, you know, my teacher trotted that out with like, look at this party though. <laughs> and anyways, and I thought, yes, you know, absolutely. We need change. I hear my mom complaining about this all the time. Like that sounds like a guy I will vote for. I guarantee you <clears throat> that I 100% voted at least once for the reform party, because then I, after school, I stopped paying attention. Right. But it was just, it was in my head. I'm definitely voting for Preston Manning. So I absolutely voted for them once. Um, but the thing is that I have, most of us were raised in conservative households because that's just what Alberta is. I, that <laughs> statistically speaking, if you were raised in Alberta, you were probably raised in a conservative household. I don't feel like conservatives based on my upbringing are awful people, right? My grandmother went to church. She gave her time volunteering. She ran for MS. She did all of these things. She gave her time and her money and her, um, you know, and her, her care and attention to so many different causes and she is conservative. So I don't look at being conservative as a bad thing. Now, I don't look at any of it as a bad thing. If you're a liberal, you're a green, you're Alberta party, Wild Rose Independence, but, but some Alberta statehood, I don't, I, oh. and I get that. <laughs> I just. It, it's very frustrating to hear is. people say yes, but this, and this is where they're drawing the line. They're drawing the line at, oh, you're a conservative or, oh, you vote conservative. Like, wow, that is way too much. But the same is being done on the opposite side. Oh, you know, you say something bad about Jason Kenney, you NDP shill. <laughs> it's like, what the? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you, you, you've, <laughs> you've opened up one of the biggest things, the biggest issues that I have with politics today. And that is, and it's not the exact issue, but it's uh, the purity test. And I talked about this on my show a while back about how the left seems to hate the right for a lot of things, but they'll never internally look at themselves when that same thing happens to them. So yeah. I just, we're all humans. We all, we all go to the washroom the same way. We all put our pants on the <laughs> same way. Like we have more that unites us than divides us. We do not need to divide us even further than we already are. And I just hope to God that in the next year we can actually come together as a province. And, you know, as I, I don't, I'm not expecting kumbaya, but I'm expecting <laughs> like a civil conversation between two people and maybe that's Rachel Notley and Jason Kenney going out to dinner and live streaming it and just seeing what their conversation <laughs> is. Like, if we can start there, I, like, I would pay money for that. Okay, let's raise some money. Jason Kenney, Rachel Notley, let's do it right here. Go out to dinner. We'll live stream it. Have a conversation about puppy dogs. Everyone loves puppy dogs. And if you don't, you're murdering me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, and I think too... Um, that was a big rant for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to remember that as much as there is some division, right? The, the, the individuals who are, who I see saying things like, you know, you're conservative. I want nothing to do with you or your thoughts or your anything. Those are in, those are individuals who um, are not uh the that that perception of others is not actually as popular as it would seem to be online yeah. it's almost it's almost the same as that you know the vaccinated unvaccinated uh divide right and how everyone thinks that it's like right down the middle or at least the unvaccinated would like you to think that it's like a canada wide 50 50 split yeah no it's like kind of 10% tops, uh, you know, of people that are like really upset about this. That's the same thing with this uh, political division. I don't think we are anywhere near what the U.S. is. And simply because of the fact that, um, well, actually, I guess in the same way that, that uh, Republicans are dying off, uh, at least populist Republican 
thinkers would be dying off. At least they've got more of the young ones coming up, the Ben Shapiro's and, and things. We don't have that in Canada. We have yet. Yet. It, it is. It is yet. Absolutely. I mean, sure. Pierre Paul of Polyev is trying to kind of take that space. He's young enough to do it. Um, Former uh, reporter for Rebel News, Keenan Brax. Oh, Baxter. Baxter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he's, yeah. That guy. Yeah. He's, uh, I mean. And everyone has the right to their opinion, as long as it might be, <clears throat> they have the right to their opinion. And yes. I would not discredit anyone for spewing off anything. But we had not, people. That's also not normal. Well, I mean, that is that is normal if you're talking about politics. But again, it's not it's not some of the rhetoric that you see being moved around oh, on exactly. line. Yeah. Online, it's like, nope, we're deeply divided. It's like, yeah, but it, go to the coffee shop because it's not. Well, I, I had Maxine Bernier on my show in the season two. The amount of hate that I had come at me because I, I had the balls to sit down with someone who I dis, might disagree with and have a conversation with, shocked me. And I know it's a very microcosm of what society actually thinks, because honestly, my show is not that big, but <laughs> like people seem to think Maxine Bernier is like murdering children somewhere in like a deep dark oh, Like alley. the absolute devil, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And honestly, like I said, he puts his pants on the exact same way. And that's how I always I look at any interview that I go in with. But I, I want people just tone it back. Like, if you don't want to listen to something, if you don't want to pay attention to something, I know this is a weird concept and all, but there is a mute button on Twitter. There is a block button on Twitter. There is a, a, there's a, a weird concept of putting your phone down and not tweeting something. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> there we I go. I knew. And um, it's, yeah, that's, that's something that I, I would like to see more of. You know, I see so many people with the, I've been blocked, I've been blocked. Um, <laughs> that actually would, that would really bother me to be blocked by MLAs and MPs because I, I need to see what they're doing. The thing is, I don't respond to everything. I did actually respond to Polly of the, or like quote tweeted him and called him a troll. And normally I don't do that. <laughs> I don't do it because if I super disagree, I just ignore it. But sometimes you're just like, man, someone's got to say something or I have to say something. And yeah, so it that was unlike me. But I try not to do that because getting blocked by these people that I need to see what they're doing and saying and talking about, that's that's an inconvenience for me. It is not an inconvenience for me to keep my thoughts to myself. And for the most part, I do. For the most part, I do. I, I scroll by things I don't like all the time. And sometimes I have to put Twitter down because that's all that's on my feed. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's a thing we need to, my, I don't know. Do my more. last question for you before we do our wrap up here <laughs> is this, and this is sort of a, what, what is Deirdre you looking for, looking at in the next year? And that is, who are you watching over the next year? What politician, what candidate, what area are you looking at in the uh, lead up to the 2023 provincial election? It might tell me something about what's going on. Yeah, it might tell you something, might go, okay, I'm watching this person because of X, Y, and Z. I'm watching this issue because it might become a bigger issue. What are you watching? And then I'll, then I'll give you mine. Okay, so I, I mean, I'm going to start close to home also because there's you know, crap in the fan over in Chestermere Strathmore. So I'm going to pay attention to Lula here because there is something going on. I don't know exactly what it is. I will find out at some point. Um, I actually, I plan to attend the next AGM if they are able to get it because I am a member. I'm a member of all parties so that I can go to these things and just hang out. Um, <laughs> I do this uh, too much. But anyways, um, but the thing is, I was a member of the UCP as of December 23rd. That was where they wanted to make the cutoff date. Well, I was a member. I still am. Therefore, I can go to this AGM. I would like to go and see what's, what's going on over there. Um, 
so I'm interested in that. Now, does that tell me a lot about what's going on with the UCP as a whole? No, absolutely not. It's just something interesting I'm going to look at from here. And also, I guess, what are the reactions from around there? Plus, you know, you make friends and some people tell you other stuff that's going on. <laughs> Things that normal that normal people wouldn't tell me. And uh, so that's why I love this show, because some of the guests that come on right after we stop recording, I go, what? would you say? They know stuff. <laughs> they know stuff. I know. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm watching that. Obviously, I'm watching Jason Kenny. I'm keeping an eye on, um, I'm keeping an eye on Shannon Phillips because her riding was like, that was so close last year or last election that I'm keeping an eye on her. I think, I think she's going to be okay, but that's something that kind of, you know, creeps out. Um, I'm, I'm looking at a couple of, uh, Kathleen Ganley. I think she's got, I think she is set in Mountain View. Um, but who else is, uh, Joe Cece? I'm going to be paying attention to him. How does, how is he looking on, on the ride up to 2013 or 2023? So, uh, do you have a few things on the, on yeah, the I've got a few people to pay attention to and, and I'm going to be looking at actually, I'm going to be paying attention to Drew Barnes and seeing where he's going to land because that could be a bit of a coup for Wild Rose. I, I honestly don't know what his plans are, but you know, he keeps popping up again and you're like, oh yeah, Drew Barnes. <laughs> I forgot that you were around. I forgot that you were in MLA still. Yes. My, where I'm looking at, and this is kind of a throw to the leaders, do they get out of their bubbles? Do they get out of the Edmonton, Calgary zones and actually tour Alberta? Because you do not see Jason Kenny and Rachel Notley outside. And I understand COVID-19 is a massive thing right now, mm -hmm. but are they going to get out or are they going to take a page out of Aaron O'Toole's book and sort of start a campaign studio where they're going to run the next campaign completely virtually? Mm -hmm. That is one of my big concerns is they might and if they do, they are in for a rude awakening because I think Albertans saw through that. And that's why we saw four opposition or non-conservative MPs elected in the last election here in Alberta. The other one that I'm looking at, and this is kind of a weird, just me being me. What other former NDP MLAs announced their run for the nomination for the party? Because we saw two party members go down, Brian Nelkinson and Alberta uh, Calgary Curry. And Maria Fitzpatrick in Lethbridge East, whatever. And I no. think she, I think she's planning to run again, Marie. She she announced and she announced that she was running for the nomination, and then she got defeated. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah. So, do other MLAs come forward, or do they see that the writing's on the wall for former MLAs and just stay back from the? Ah. So that's that's the two areas that I'm looking at, and it's more it's more from just a perspective of. Are the, are the NDP moving to that center and trying to go away from that 2015 to 2019 uh, government years? So that's where. Yeah. Actually, okay, I can I can see that because there were, um, I mean, from 2015 to 2019, there were some problematic incidences, yeah. not major, not anything like, oh. <laughs> you know. But but they they have had yeah there's been a a little bit with with that that NDP kind of background and and oh who oh I can't remember her name but I mean the it's not like the UCP doesn't have the same problem the UCP no. absolutely has a similar problem but they actually uh, that works for them that the problem that the UCP has they don't have too much of a problem with. I agree. One of the other areas is, does the potential sexual allegations against two former NDP MLAs come to light again? Because if you remember in the last year of their term, the, it was, uh, the, there was news reports of a potential scandal of two NDP MLAs potentially having uh, assaulted or have said something nothing came of it and then with this whole sean chu thing happening in calgary does it come back to light so does that come back and bite them in the ass if they haven't been completely open about it 
Um, I'll just piss off a few more people. Oh, don't worry. I've already pissed them <laughs> off. Go for it. You notice that a very few partisans will call out their own for the same thing that they will. Yes. So you don't hear about it because these guys are being really quiet now. I mean, oh no, but when Sean Chu thing came out, a lot of the NDP MLAs came out and said he needs to resign, which I wanted to say, what about your, <laughs> can you look in the mirror for once as Jim Prentice would say? <laughs> yeah. And I think it's, and I mean, uh, there are, there are certain individuals who will call out no matter where it's coming from. Uh, they don't tend to be uh, the most popular individuals on the left. So, Yeah. Um, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an uh, enlightening hour and 10 minutes of fun excitement <laughs> of talking politics. Always enjoy talking politics with people. Um, but before we go, I have one last thing from you. Yeah. Let's talk about your podcast for a second. How can people yeah. tune in? How can people learn more about it? What What do you talk about with Kathleen Smith? Oh. Or Kiki Planet, for those who <laughs> know her on Twitter. <laughs> so the Women of AB Poly podcast, we... Kathleen and I will do ones that are just ourselves uh, for Patreon subscribers. You can find us at uh, Political R&D. And when we do our interviews, we tend to bring in women who are who have an experience that they can enlighten us about. And we that one is a little more interviewee, but it's it's also more coffee chat. That <laughs> that is that's some of the things that we've that we've heard back on it that that we bring in two people, two women who have something interesting to tell us. And, uh, you know, I've definitely heard people say it's like, it's like having coffee with my friends and then it's over. And I wish it could go on longer. We could listen to this for two hours. So it's, yeah, it's, it's looking at, at some different perspectives on mostly life in general rather than being specifically about politics. But what we discovered is that no matter what we're getting together to talk about, it's always political. Every, it's, it always has a political solution. There would be a solution to any of these issues that we're having. Everything um, comes down to politics. At it the end really the does. Thing. Yeah. So, so when does it come out? Because uh, I know you, the last episode that I heard was back in December, but when uh, does it come out on a regular basis? Are we expecting one here? It soon? normally comes out on a regular basis. It, you may be able to tell I'm, I'm a little stuffy. <laughs> I was sick for a week and isolating for a week. Um, I have a full house because my mother and grandmother have moved back in with me. Um, which I spent a week moving them in. So it's been, we've been a little off kilter over the last couple of weeks here. Um, and then as it turned out after five days of self-isolating, I also homeschool a couple of kids. Um, so I have to catch up on that too. So it's been, it's, this month has kind of been the busiest month I've had in the last two years, yet I accomplished nothing. <laughs> so uh, I mean, I'm getting there. We're getting caught up on school stuff because apparently if I'm not in the room to say kids do this, then they don't. So yeah, it's been fun. Um, and how can people normally, find you? How can people find you? Or you people... can find us at Political r and on Twitter. Um, our podcasts are also uh, politicalrnd.ca that has, you know, my articles will go up there, but also the podcast can be found there as well. And... Of course, on Patreon, we do have a couple more, like I said, some additional things that go on for subscribers there. And um, yeah, we talk about we talk about politics. Kathleen rants. Um, what? <laughs> Kathleen likes to talk. I, I just I, Kathleen I can't imagine. sometimes gets upset. She's she sometimes seems so she reserved. Upset. She seems so held back at all times. <laughs> Like I never uh, see her tweet anything. It's just weird. Right. Right. Yeah. So normally we do post our um, we do post our podcast on Thursdays. Usually Thursday during the day. I prefer to do um, once once I get 
you know, I'm, I'm, I am feeling better, even though I sound like this, I actually am feeling better. I have no idea what I had because <laughs> who had a rat, not me. So At least, uh, we couldn't find one. So yeah. <laughs> mm, yeah. I called around, I had things on Facebook and I fevered for three days. So I don't know. Now I sound like this. I do. I assume it's Omicron. I'm hearing people say we've got all these symptoms and it's not. Uh, so I don't know. I never did find out. Well, I want to thank you once again for, well, I, I, if you wouldn't have said that you were sick, I wouldn't have been able to tell that you were sick or stuffed ah. up. I just sounded very normal. Like it sounded like I was listening to a podcast or your show. So I want to thank you so much for doing this and taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and talk politics. And it's always a pleasure yes. to do this with people like yourself. And thank you so much because I haven't had this conversation in three weeks. So <laughs> but I really needed this too. <laughs> Um, for everyone here at the Crossboard Interviews with Chris Brown, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, guys, and I'm, I say this all the time, but I got to keep on reiterating it. Just keep talking. Just have a conversation. Go out and just sit down and have a coffee, socially distance, or vi just have a conversation via Zoom like we do. Uh, for everyone here at the Crossboard Interviews, have yourself an excellent day, guys.